the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead, two of his disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. As they were walking, they were discussing all that happened. Jesus appeared to them. He didn't allow them to recognize who he was. And as they were walking along the road, they talked all about events surrounding Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and how the religious leaders handed him over to death. During that conversation, Jesus starts with Moses and the prophets and begins to share what the scriptures say concerning himself. When they reached the village, the men invited Jesus, unbeknownst to them, to stay for dinner. When Jesus broke the bread and gave it to them, it was at that moment that their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. And then Jesus was gone from them. They looked at each other and said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? We don't know all that Jesus said to them, but we do know that all through the Old Testament are images, pictures, shadows, if you will, of Jesus. We want to share some of those stories with you. During this series, we want to take you back and look at the many moments in the Old Testament that are beautiful pictures of Jesus. Take a journey with us for our series, Shadows, Finding Jesus in the Old Testament. Thank you for your worship. What a joy to come to the message now. I, before I do, I want to give you an update that we had a wonderful time in Mexico. Thank you for praying for us. I know we had put that out uh, two weeks ago and we left, got back early in the morning on Wednesday of this week. Um, so I've got a few pictures to show you. It'll only take about five hours. No, just kidding. The first one is of the main leader of the orphanage. Her name is Sarah Gomez, and we were the long and the short of it. <laughs> she has taken over for her mother, Martha, who started the orphanage 60 years ago. And uh, the morning after we got there, she took us in the chapel area and told us her story, which is one filled with honesty and brokenness and how God rescued her. And then she is now motivated to rescue other and love other people whose lives are also broken. And so we were immediately... Um, loving her and our hearts were knit with with Sarah she's in charge of two orphanages and a woman's shelter um, so I wanted to introduce her to you Sarah Gomez I hope and pray that many of you will be touched by her life and even our young people in God's time will have the chance to hear her story and other leaders that we also have met who work in the orphanage national leaders and folks from the United States that have been loving and ministering with these orphans for many years in Tijuana. The, the mission is called Tijuana Christian Mission, and again, it's just over the border from San Diego. Um, there's a wall here we'll show. Uh, this is, there's actually two walls there, one from the Bush era and one from the Trump era. And so we saw this wall, it goes out to the ocean. You can see too, the beautiful Pacific Ocean. So it really divides two kingdoms, two countries, and uh, the orphanage is within sight of these two walls. And so it's very close. Uh, one of the reasons we were attracted to this ministry, because you can fly to San Diego in the U.S. and then just drive across. There's a Walmart down the street in Mexico. There's a Home Depot, a 7-Eleven. Uh, and then if there's a medical emergency, you can come right back into the U.S. easily. Um, so it's close, but you get the shock, uh, the exposure to another country, another culture, another style of living that will cause you to look at your own life here differently and our children look at their life differently here uh, ever, ever since. And so we, we found the, uh, also we found the city to be safe. You can ask Loretta and Matt what they thought. Um, we were going to examine whether it was safe. We hear so much of the news in Tijuana of all that's going on. Turns out a lot of that is people going down for the wrong reasons and doing the wrong things in the wrong places with putting themselves close to what they call the red zone where the gangs are and so much of the violence is taking place that you hear about in the news. The workers coming back and forth uh, is very routine and also the ministries that take place are, we felt very safe. We, we didn't go certain places like you wouldn't in Columbus or even in Lancaster. Um, 
Leanne kept us safe. She knew about this, that the nationals know about that. We went to the beach, went to the boardwalk, we went to the wall. We walked around and had tacos in the street. And even though we stuck out like me, I don't blend in in Mexico at all. <laughs> um, we, felt, we felt safe. And then there's the joy of seeing these folks and the adventure of being with these orphans. So then we go to the orphanage. There are two, one for the older folks, the teenage, and then one for all the way down to three years old, up to 18, out, out in Rosarito, which is on the road down to Ensenada. And again, just all within view of the Pacific Ocean where the mountains come down to the beach. And it's just gorgeous. So uh, two orphanages uh, that we visited. These orphans all have a tragic story. Um, you know, and this is our chance to love them. It's our chance to come and be like grandparents spoiling them. Just the fact that we show up, they feel loved. And they seem happy because they're in a safe environment. They're able to be kids. Um, but they need love, the love they did not get in their families. The government uh, brings them here to, to the orphanages. And again, you just have no idea. From three years old on up, the stuff that they've been through and the brokenness in their lives. So we use basketball, and, and uh, it broke through with the guys that, that they love basketball. We bought basketballs. This is all with your money, by the way. So I just want you to know that you already made this investment. I want your heart to go with you. We went with you and represented you that we love these orphans. And through basketball and through arts and crafts and a giant game of Uno on the last night with the, the high school age uh, orphans, that was so much fun. Um, we just communicated that we love them. We baked lasagna and cookies and we ordered pizza and we bought ice cream and made sundaes. And we crossed the barrier in so many creative ways with... Um, these orphans, just to tell them that we, we love them. Um, we went to a church, a great church in, um, uh, in Tijuana uh, called All Peoples. And it's everything in English and Spanish, even the preaching. Uh, all along, they're, they're translating it on stage with two people. And super people that we're getting to know that are in all kinds of ministries, including the Red Zone. People reaching out to the prostitutes and the drug dealers and and longtime missionaries, you get to know a lot of uh, Americans speaking English in this church. And, uh, and then finally, uh, just the team and the time that we got together. Well, I, you know, Matt, you, our youth pastor, I didn't even know until I went on this trip. We're always so serious, doing meetings every day, and I had no idea how funny he was. He is hysterical. I'm belly laugh funny. And I even had to room with him, and I still love him. And I just discovered a new friend, and he loved Mexico first time there, ADD, just loving it all. And um, so love him. Loretta uh, shares the mission sharing with Dave of our missions team. She asked all kinds of questions. She reached out with the heart of her grandmother to the orphans and really loved them and determined to cross the language barrier. It was wonderful to see. Leanne Worcester um, took care of us, got us down there, got us back safely and healthy. And, and then her daughter, Emily, was the star, the rock star. She, she was in the University of Miami in Ohio, went on this trip, and then transferred to San Diego State just to be able to drive down two, three times a week and love these orphans. And so she just led us into this experience, and we just watched her love these orphans. And she's still just 21, you know, in, in almost every other way. But then you see this amazing miracle and this excitement in her life. So... We love the team. We, we, we got to know each other, and I think in a way that, that we'll never forget. And then just finally, we hope for the future that there'll be more of these experiences as we feel comfortable and as God leads. We hope to, to partner with uh, TCM, Tijuana Christian Mission, and these orphans. So anyway, a little update there on the missions team, and thank you for your prayers. Um, then uh, also we sponsored the movie night last night, D Destination, downtown Destination, and... and um, Zootopia, and so we had a good representation there. So many were there with the t-shirts on and reaching out to a big crowd, beautiful weather night, uh, and, and uh, our, our church was well represented as one of the sponsors for the movie last night downtown. So we, re we, we celebrate that as well. Well, then in the time that remains, um, it is exciting to give another shadow from the Old Testament that becomes the substance or the reality in the New Testament, which just means it has points to something that has even greater significance. Though both are hugely important, 
the substance in the New Testament has so much more relevance and glory uh, to us. And so, of course, today, um, I'll start with this. I, I looked it up this week online because I, I was thinking, how many self-improvement books are out there? Do you have any idea how many are published in the U.S. every year that you could put in the category of self-improvement and people are buying them? They're bestsellers, and they're offering to improve your life. 15,000 books are published in this category just in the U.S. alone every year. Yeah, four of the top titles are How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, and then Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. But there's a list of 100 classics that are all multi-million dollar bestsellers. And, you know, people are buying, scarfing this up. Because we all, and this is the first statement in the message today, we all have a need to improve our lives. Most people have a strong desire to improve their life. But we can say at least we all have a need. We do a lot of things that we shouldn't do. Right? And, and we don't do a lot of the things that we should do. And as a result, we have a great amount of dysfunction. And we have a strong desire to progress. And when we do, when we ever have any real progress or improvement in our life, there's no greater joy. I mean, it's ours. It's our life. It's the life we live in. And when it gets better in some way, that's our value that goes up. That's our joy. That's our satisfaction. That's our blessing for others. And so there's a strong desire that we all have. And, and I'll just say this, long before the market flooded with self-improvement or self-help books, God wrote a book on how to improve our lives. And it is still by far the best-selling book in the world. And you could look at it that way, that, you know, he wrote it for us after we turned away from him and made a mess. And then desperately needed help to improve. And get better. And so he wrote a book, a best selling book, because we were in desperate need of improvement. And that book has two parts, okay? It came out, and there was an Old Testament or an old section and a New Testament. And the first part of the book was huge, it was all there was. And even now, it's longer, it's the 39 books, and the other is 27 sub books. And you know, the one was the, all they had for thousands of years. And so I don't want to minimize that first section of the book, but the second one has much more glory. Okay, that first section is called the Old Testament, or we could call it the Old Covenant. If we're looking at it in a more general way, we could call it the law. And it was the way God approached his people who were in a mess to help them improve, to help them get better, to heal to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to be made right, to be able to reach their potential. But then we can call that second section the New Testament, the New Covenant, or grace. Instead of the law, it's grace. And when you compare the two, and if we understand how the two relate, the shadow, the substance, and we receive both in the same best-selling book, there is no greater recipe for improvement. And this is what's so exciting. All the passion to read the self-improvement books need to at least consider the ultimate bestseller that has millions and millions of testimonies of not just improvement, but tr total transformation, permanent transformation and change of life to something so much better. Now, we're actually talking more than just two parts of a book or even two uh, sections, testaments, whatever. They're covenants. All right, and this is distinct because, this is important because a covenant is a legal agreement between two people that is more serious than a business contract. The closest thing we have in our society that we're familiar with is the covenant of marriage. Okay, and so you have to understand that both sections of God's best-selling book on self-improvement is, uh, are both covenants. So it's not just a, a, a filled with take it or leave it advice like a lot of these self-help books. He's actually inviting us to enter in both sections to enter a deeply personal and binding agreement with him. And that's where we truly improve is when we make that, that permanent commitment. 
that deeply personal commitment that's more sacred than marriage. And, and so that's already where it's beginning to be un unique and much more helpful and transformational. Um, now the best one to describe this, or at least a very good one to describe this, is the Apostle Paul, who himself was a, a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And so as a top Pharisee, he was extremely familiar with the Old Testament, or the first section of God's book. He probably had the first five books, the Torah, or the Pentateuch, he probably had Genesis through Deuteronomy memorized. He knew it so well. He lived it out. The spirit of the law, the benefit of the law. Again, which is something very good. It's just incomplete. And in itself, it's a shadow compared to what would come later. But he knew that well, and he was at the top of that uh, system. And so he could describe it. He could understand it, that first part. And then, you know, also... The minute he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he also had a dramatic and fresh experience of the new covenant. And he became, became the greatest missionary and wrote, obviously, the most books in the New Testament, the second section or the new covenant. And so he puts a great uh, passage together or chapter or section we're going to read now that describe how the two relate, how we should approach both Sections of God's best-selling book on self-improvement. And uh, helps us put it in perspective and say, well, why was the first one so important? And why did God give that first? And how is the new, uh, make, how does it make it complete? And how does the whole book then together help me to improve so I don't have so much dysfunction in my life? So I want to get better. I want that joy of progress and growth in my life. Okay, so here we go. He describes it, and again, this is going to be tough reading, but uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Follow with me. These are the words of the Apostle Paul, and he'll describe both sections of God's book or God's Bible. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, he says, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And that's the part I got the idea about improvement. The improvement that can take place if you get this message or this chapter and the truth it's speaking about the two covenants. 
is an improvement that will go from glory to glory or with ever increasing glory. And glory of what? Of God. On his level, transformation. Doesn't it fade away? Isn't based on you and me? This is, why we're, this is what we're talking about. Coming to God's bestseller and putting these things in perspective. All right. Now, as we, as we approach this, let me just say, he's referring, and if you're not familiar, I'll just give you a quick paragraph summary. He is referring to Exodus 34 and a little bit to Exodus 33, if you want to look this up later. Moses went up on Mount Sinai when they were out in the desert, you know, and he had two million people that had just escaped from Egypt. And God was about to set up a nation. Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to meet with God and get the Ten Commandments. Many of us, if we're old, have seen the old Ten Commandments movie, right? And remember Charlton Heston, the whole thing. It d- dramatized this event. And while he was up there, God, through his power, wrote the Ten Commandments himself and then carved it out of the stone. And Moses came down with the commandments in his hand. And when he came back down from the mount, it says, from being with God, and God said he actually talked to Moses like a man talks to his friend face to face. He came down, and as a result of being with God like that, his face was shining. So much so that the people were scared. They were not comfortable to be around Moses. So he had to actually put a veil on over his face for the people to be able to stand to be around him. This is all Old Covenant. There's glory there. God's hand carving the stone. Moses with this shining face. But it's passing away. It's fading. It's nothing like what we get to experience. Okay, so that's the story. It's simple. He comes back down. He's got this glow. He puts on a veil. You can look it up. Exodus 34, Exodus 33. Talk about how Moses represented the people. They didn't get to do what he did. He was the one that got to go. They stood at the entrance to all their tents, and they were scared, and they were thinking, here goes Moses into God's presence. Bro, with all the thunder and lightning, and it's a woo. You know, they knew it. He comes back. He's the only one. He's shining, lit up. They're like, put on a veil. We can't stand it. Experience God. Talk to God for us. Okay, you get the picture. Now, here, I'm just going to make two points today. All right, because there's so much. You could take a whole, do a whole course on this. But I'm going to just make two points. The new covenant, okay, we're talking about shadows now. The substance of the New Testament, all right, we're going to talk about how it's different. The new covenant offers an experience of God's glory to all of God's people, not just one man. Simple point. And that's why it's more glorious. And that's why it's not the shadow, but the substance. That's why, hey, man, if you were impressed with that, with Moses going up the mountain, that movie, and how that was dramatized and the whole deal, wait till you see what happens in the new. Well, what is it? Well, now that same glory is available to every one of God's people that Moses got to experience. Well, what is that? Well, like God would talk to you like he does with his A man with his friend and your face as a result is going to shine so bad that people are like. Okay, so this is huge. And this is that last verse we read. We all with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. Paul's like, he's like, hey, look at the difference. He's getting so excited because he's a Pharisee, so familiar. He's memorized these other passages that, that I'm referring to in Exodus. And he's like, it's so different. It's not just Moses, it's all of us, and it's not like it's going to fade. It's just going to keep increasing, and, and it's not meant to be veiled. It's not meant to be covered. Now it's meant to exude. It's meant to shine, and it's meant to go on shining and getting better. And so actually your improvement is going to come from God. It's going to come from seeing him, experiencing him, just like Moses did, and then not having just to be the people watching some other person they put on a pedestal. In fact, I thought about this this week. I thought, man, one day I'm going to meet Moses in heaven. I'm going to say, Moses, what was it like to be in God's presence when you got the Ten Commandments and your face was shining? I mean, what did that feel like to have that radiance? I mean, did you look in the mirror? What did you think? What did it look like, you know? How did that feel? Is it better than a suntan? I mean, what, were you impressed with yourself? And I feel like I can imagine Moses saying, hey, don't put me on a pedestal. I put you on a pedestal. 
Didn't you realize in the new covenant you had the chance to experience much more of God's glory than I did? A surpassing glory? What was that like through the power of the Holy Spirit? (laughs) And that that would shine through your face with no veil? And it wouldn't fade. It wouldn't be like I put the veil on and he kept the veil on even after it had faded because he was ashamed. His shine wore off. For us, it just gets brighter and brighter. And is the whole basis for the hope that we have that we can improve. That the, the source of the improvement is not in us. Oh, my past, I'm, I'll never be great because of my past. I'm dragging it around, it's defining me. Oh, I'm not very good looking. I don't have much talent. Nothing I'm very good at. I don't have much drive and like these other people that are great. And so I don't know if I'll ever get to be great in my life because I don't have any determination. All of that is looking inside for the improvement. And God's bestseller comes out and says, hey, by the second one, do you not get it? The source of your greatness is God himself. The source of your improvement is not in you. I'm not telling you dig deep. Come on. Try harder. And then give you the credit and the glory when you do it. And so you're either intimidated or proud or whatever. That's most of the other books. And God's book's like, I'll share my greatness with you. I'll put my glory in your face. In your face. Greater glory than Moses. What is that? Well, it's my love, God says. It's my kindness. It's my joy. It's the peace. It's all there in the face. Your face is like a big billboard sign to everybody. It's just giving you away. Haughty eyes. Anxious intimidated, fearful, it's all right on the face. And no matter what we think, talk about, people say it. (laughs) It's so obvious. Let's look at his face. And God, that's right. And that's where I'm going to put my glory. On your face. And you say, well, I don't like my face. It's getting older and wrinkled. God says, I don't care if you're wrinkled or smooth. I don't care the shape of your eyes or how high your cheekbones are. I don't care if you're pretty or handsome or ugly. That is not your hope for glory. Want to make yourself prettier? Go ahead. It's a losing game. It certainly won't be ever increasing. And it's discouraging. And it's why so many people give up. And God's like, here's a better deal. You're not just standing at your tent, and Moses is not just the only one, the representative. Now you can be like Moses. We all get to be like Moses. God says, I'll talk to you. And we say, well, what does that mean? It's by faith. Of course it's by faith. Through the Spirit, yes. Not through visible, not through. But it's going to be me, and it's going to be a gift, and it's going to be grace. And when you experience that greatness, that improvement, it's a transformation of God from glory to glory. And then you give him the credit, you give him the glory, and the praise. and, 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 And there's no failure, there's no weakness on our part that can stop it. Except our own choice, our own decision. And so he talks about the veil, and I don't want to get too complicated. I was even debating whether to include this today, but he, he changes the metaphor of the veil, and he said the veil covered the glory so the people could not see it. And he goes, in this new covenant, no veil. Because the glory is not supposed to be covered. God and his will and his, he's like, I'm not covering my glory anymore. This is all about shining. And he said, that veil is still there. And here's what you can expect. If you come from the old into the new, then you can expect that veil, which is, which is still covering the glory only. It's over our eyes. It's over our hearts. And so the things of God are dull to us because we can't see them. And, and God's like, so in Christ, expect if you come into his book, the second part, and you want that greater glory, you come from the shadow of the law into the substance of the grace of the New Testament, then one of the things you can expect is for that veil to be taken off. 
And people talk about it. I remember one of the first guys I ever led to Christ was in North Carolina. And it was my privilege on the first day we started the church there for him to come to faith. And then I would watch him, walk with him. He's now with the Lord. And his name is Paige Patty. And he would just look at me. He was a construction worker. He was a contractor for, like, he built, built Walmarts and different things. And he just never had faith. He was always he was a biologist and then a construction worker. And then he, he just looked at me. And he just said, the scales fell off my eye. And when he, if, if you had heard him say that, you would believe him. He was never the same. Because now he could see the thing that actually has the most glory. Everything has its glory. A flower, all the things we like that have our attention, have a certain glory. Then we just have to ask, okay, this thing I'm fascinated with, and I made a list of them. There's a lot of things. Entertainment, um, a relationship, business, success, money, sex, whatever it is for you, yourself. <laughs> what is the thing that fascinates you? Business, sports, politics, all oh, fine and great and wonderful. And they all have their glory. Like last night it was, it was our town of Lancaster in its glory. If you were down there. Perfect. Movie, beautiful weather, gorgeous downtown, safe. You would say, and we said it, we said this is the glory of a small town. And right now, there is the glory of so many things. And the question we have to ask is, I am fascinated with this and I see the glory and I'm attracted to this. Sit in front of the TV or I'm attracted to this, chase after success in my business or money or material things or Oh, I don't know. What is it for you to be honest? What are you fascinated with? What puts a light in your eye? What are you excited about? Then ask, is, what is that doing to change or improve me? A lot of things have their glory. What do you think the glory of God would be like? Oh, this is God in all his glory. Well, he definitely would rain. Thank you, Lord, for the rain. <laughs> we need that. Listen, to see the glory of God and to experience the glory of God, to have the veil removed, this is what is promised in the new covenant. And I, I just want to ask you, what are you fascinated with? Is God dull? Is the Bible dull? Ask God to remove the veil and give you that wonder that glory, so that the first thing you're paying attention to and looking at in your life will be the thing that will most change you and most improve you as he shares his glory with you with ever-increasing glory, from glory to glory. All right. And the second thing, and we'll just touch this one. I know we're getting away with our time. The second point is simply the new covenant comes through the spirit, not just the letter. The hand of God wrote on the mountain. Now in the New Testament, the hand writes on our heart. And let me just apply that to parenting, okay? I remember my son in high school. He was really in a bad place. And he was discouraged. And part of it was his fault. And so I was giving him a lecture. You know, one of those make it up as you go. I'm sharing the frustration with you, son, and I'm trying to fix you kind of talks. Have you been there? Have you done that as a parent? And so I'm looking at my son, and he's real smart. He's way smarter than me. That came out later. But he's looking at me while I'm telling him, Rick, you know you need to do this, this, this. And I'm giving him the first part of the Bible. I'm giving him the law, the standard, which is the character of God. It's so important. Here's what you should do. Here's what you shouldn't do. Now, Rick, you know that you've been at fault, and you need to correct, and you need to do, and you need to do. And his face is sinking. And because he's just like, he didn't say this, but he's like, Dad, I'm smarter than you, and I already know all this stuff. And you're just confirming it, and you're just magnifying it and making me feel worse. And I'm hearing that. I'm realizing his face is, this isn't working. And so continuing to make up this, this little lecture, I shifted to how I could help him. And I remember thinking, how can me as a father do things he can't do for himself? So I thought, man, I'll go talk to that teacher. That's on your back. And I'll help her understand what's going on in your life. And we can partner together. And I'll give you some space. 
And we need to get some things going that aren't just frustrating your life, but things that you enjoy so you can rest and feel better, have a mental health day. And when I started on that side of my lecture, I could see his face like, why? Because I went from the old covenant to the new covenant. I went from the letter that kills to the spirit that gives life. The law says, do this, do that, do this, do that. And it just kills our spirit. It kills our hopes and dreams because we can't do it. And it was originally given to show us that, to just bring us to that point of desperation. Yes, we need it that we are... We, 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 we have failed, we are, our life is a mess in all these ways, but then it just leaves us there. And it was pointing through the sacrifice to it, but then Jesus had to come along in the New Testament. And this is where we are with communion this morning. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. He said, this is so much who I am. This is so much what I'm about that I'm going to call my great sacrifice the new covenant. Because he said, that letter is killing you, I'll let it kill me. And I'll take the punishment, the penalty for it. Now I'm going to give you the spirit. I'm going to write my law in the New Testament. It's still the law, it's still the character of God, but it's written on your heart. Now listen, as parents, if our kids aren't new covenant kids, they're only going to do what we say while they're having to follow our rules. And the minute they leave us... See, they don't have it in their heart. And to get it in their heart, God has to write it. Not on a tablet of stone out here, but on their heart. And they, what's out there gets in here. That's the goal. That's the greater glory of the substance, not the shadow. Okay, the spirit the, it brings life. The latter kills. Jesus let the law kill him so that the spirit could give us and so we think about that as we take communion right now. Again, we say these words almost every Sunday. Jesus said, and he got to the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus right now, he wants, wants you to just say, hey, all those obligations and the things that make me feel so guilty. And it's like, I, I let that, Jesus said, I let that kill me. Now I want to give you life. I want to give you hope. I want to help you. I'm going to write it on your heart. I'll make you want to do it. Okay. So we think about that as we take communion now. Jesus, on the night he was your trade, he took bread. He said, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it to remember me. Then after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant. In my blood, do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for bringing a whole new covenant. Thank you for welcoming us into a whole new way of improving and growing. And Lord, we pray that you would shine your glory unveiled in our face and that we would reflect that glory and that, Lord, we would grow, we would, we would improve, we would get better as we experience and, and reflect your glory. Oh, Lord, write these words on our hearts. Through your spirit, make us want to stop sinning and start doing all the things that you want us to do. Put that in our heart. Remove the veil. We pray we would see your glory. Thank you for this series, Lord. Help us as we continue to examine the, the shadows of you in the Old Testament and the great substance in Jesus and in the New Testament. Thank you, Lord. Bless us now as we sing. It's in your name we pray. Amen.